Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second installment of our 2024 Sourly Presents People and Perspectives. My name is Nancy Easterling. It is my honor to serve as the Executive Director of Historic Sauterly. This evening, we are so fortunate to have wonderful panelists who are going to be addressing a topic that is very timely this year, as it is the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, I am fortunate enough to call all of them my friends, but they are here not because they are my friends, but because they are incredible leaders who are starting to move forward in this world and, and making a real difference and their ideas and perspectives are going to be so appreciated. Uh, we have one of our, um, oh, so Jalon, you wanna come on camera? I see Jalon's over in the, um, is here and he is, um, Oh, he's been stuck on the other side. I, we will work to get Jalen here. He is he is here. He's just not um, in the... Uh, okay, he's going to be joining us in just a second. But Kelsey, uh, let me turn this over to our moderator for this evening, who also is a very special person in our lives. In his day job, he works for St. Mary's College of Mar uh, Maryland as the uh, community affairs liaison. But to us at Sauterly, not only is he family, he is the secretary of our board of trustees and he also is a Sauterly descendant. Kelsey, thank you so much for your moderation this evening. Let me turn this over to you so we can get going and, and we will work, uh, Jalen, we will work to get you on here. So I'll be off uh, and I'll get back on with you for just a second. Thank you, Nancy, for that wonderful introduction. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening uh, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Act. 60 years might seem like a long time ago for some of us, but as they say, time and even age are relative. To put it in perspective, in our world today, there is an affinity to denigrate young voices because of their lack of experience or they need to show respect. However, we forget that many of the voices that led the civil rights movement belong to young people, especially for them to say, enough. For example, in 1964, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was 35 years old. Representative John Lewis was 24. Stokely Carmichael, later known as Kwame Tour, was 23. Diane Nash was 26. This does not take into account those who participated in the freedom rights, sit-ins, the children who participated in the 1963 Alabama Children's Crusade or those who lost their lives in the 16th Street bombing. Young people have been leaders and voices of change who over time were proven that they were correct. In that same vein, we have brought together a panel of young leaders to discuss their views on the Civil Rights Amendment. Tonight, we have Phoebe Tate, who is a senior at St. Mary's College of Maryland, majoring in English with a minor in educational studies, ultimately with the goal of obtaining a master's in teaching. We have Roderick Lewis, who is Senator Ben Carnance, Prince George's County and Southern Maryland Field Representative. And we have Jay Leon um, Moni, um, Moni, 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 who will be joining us once he comes in from the other side, um, who is the Deputy Director of the Star Center um, for the study of the America, the American at Washington College. 
thank you for all for being here this evening. And we'll start with our first question, and then we'll let Jillian uh, jump in with us. And let's ask this question. How has the Civil Rights Amendment of 1964 impacted your life and the lives of those around you? And Phoebe, since you are the senior who's about to graduate soon, we'll start with you. All right, again, thank you for having me here. Um, so to answer the first question, I had to think about that for a little while. So um, for anyone who might not be familiar with the 1964 Civil Rights Amendment, um, it pretty much guaranteed, it was a guarantee that regardless on that you cannot be discriminated, especially for um, jobs and housing based on your race, religion, your sex, your sex and um, other identities. And so I know for me personally, when I look at the amendment I, for the Civil Rights Amendment, I see it as a guarantee that I am valued pretty much in the workplace, that no matter what, I cannot be discriminated against. And that if this does happen, I have the backings of basically legality in the government that this cannot stand. And so that's where it pretty much focus on my life. When it comes to the life of others, I have to admit that especially with older generations that are could actually remember the civil rights movement or the immediate impacts of the civil rights movement, they tend not to really talk so much about it. And so what I've really learned I get is from my classes of what it was supposed to guarantee and from a history book, which may not always reflect the everyday experience of many people. Roderick? You're still muted there for some reason there, Roderick. Because I know you're going to spin some wisdom, and I want to make sure everyone hears it. Okay, can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay. I was saying that... Um... Phoebe was, you know, spot on in, in, in describing what the Civil Rights Amendment, you know, sought out to to achieve and, and did achieve it in many ways. I immediately, you know, think to what type of, you know, um, uh, opportunities my my grandparents, my my parents would have, would have had if it wasn't for the Civil Rights Amendment, let alone, you know, the type of opportunities my siblings and I would have been able to to have if it wasn't for the Civil Rights Amendment. It really opened up society in many ways for Black Americans to, to have access to, to, to spaces, you know, that they were not allowed to be in uh, beforehand. So it, you know, was a major achievement uh, in the struggle to advance civil rights in this country. Um, and it's really hard to, to think about what life would be like without it. I, it's a, it's an interesting thing that, you know, they say sometimes those things that are present in your life from the beginning, you can't picture anything without yeah. it. Or even even when it comes to present, you can't picture it without it. Um, okay, right now, moving on to our second question, you know, kind of in the same vein, you know, because we live in in a, in a strange world. You know, much like we're experiencing right now with our technical difficulties we're having with, you know, trying to get Jaylee on on. Right now, people are ha have been con focused on the rollbacks and attacks on DEI, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, which I, I feel right now someone's going to run in and, and put soap in my mouth or something because it seems like it's a bad word in some places. And ostensibly, the Civil Rights Act. However, this and other acts that ensure the fair treatment um, for government in government and, and business have been under siege for a while. Could any of you speak to this? And you know, and I'm gonna lob that over to Roderick first, since you know where you who you work for, not to put you under the microscope, but I have a you know, I figure that y'all talk about this a little bit much over there. Well, um, you know, people are, are rightly concerned about the rollbacks in, you know, the DEI that we're seeing and the Civil Rights Act, but that's not the 
only rollbacks that we're currently witnessing, and they're not the only rollbacks that are currently being, you know, kind of threatened uh, upon us. We know just recently uh, the Supreme Court landed down a decision in Roe versus Wade that rolled back the rights for women with respect to, uh, you know, uh, reproductive, reproductive freedom. Um, and in that decision, uh, Justice uh, Clarence Thomas, meant, you know, cited other Supreme Court cases, you know, uh, Griswold v. Connecticut, uh, Lawrence uh, v. Texas, and um, Obergefell v. Um, Hodges, uh, that speaks to, you know, uh, gay rights and contraceptive access to contraception um, in this country. And so uh, when you talk about, um, you know, in the business community and in government, in, in many ways, uh, we have businesses and, 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 and places in our government that are uh, leading us into the more inclusion uh, area. Uh, but we have, um, you know, forces that are, you know, trying to turn back the, you know, the time clock uh, in many ways on, on many topics that uh, my generation really, you know, views as, you know, settled issues. Um, we're having to relitigate a lot of this um, in, in, in the public space. And I think, uh, you know, we, we hear a lot about the book banning and, and, and that is important information, but there's uh, so many aspects to our life that, you know, we take as, you know, rights that we currently have that are currently and actively being discussed about potentially changing. I think that's really uh, troubling. Phoebe? All right. So when I think about this question, I think about my background in education and trying to become a teacher and especially how DEI is looked when considering education policy and to how to teach, because in many places, that is where some of the first attacks come when it comes to like what Roderick was mentioning with the book banning and when it was mentioning. Um, so you had like critical race theory that was um heavily opposed in many areas. You have a lot of legislation limiting the certain um, exposure to DEI to students from, with teachers often facing the penalties for it. And so a lot of this does feel like an almost rolling back of, of rights that we were felt like were guaranteed that, like Roger said, that for a lot of generations, and especially my generation, it felt like this was supposed to be a settled issue and the foundation for um, future progression of society. And so it almost feels in a way, a betrayal of what we've been taught in many ways when it comes for, for younger um, people. But I also want to um, kind of point out to the fact that in a lot of things that we live in a society that also tends to focus on a lot of the negativity and especially when it comes to like media. So a lot of our exposure to some of these um, rights act being um, pulled back, we're either not seeing it or we're only seeing the negative side. And it's very hard to um, get really to see some of the progress that we are still making and the progress that we're still being able to push forward. And sometimes we do we do get lost in, in the darkness and we have to look for those, those beams of light to, to get us through get us through because otherwise we can we can completely forget about the other side but you know Roderick you mentioned something about all the cases he mentioned but what was interesting and there he is there he is I don't know if you want to chime in on this one uh, it was our second question, which was, um, right now people are um, have become focused on the rollbacks and attacks on uh, DEI and ostensibly the Civil Rights Act. And however, um, and other acts that ensure the treatment, the the fair treatment for government and businesses and how they've been under, how those are, have been under siege. Um and if you want to, you want to chime in before we move on to our next question. And you want to do a brief introduction of yourself so that we can do all that all wrapped into one. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. <sighs> I know it's been rough. You can catch your breath. Thank you. Much like the theme for tonight's conversation, we prevail. So I'm very grateful to have gotten over those technical difficulties and have joined each of you. And I guess I can 
rumble through the first two questions because I've been listening and so eager to speak, but I didn't appear. <laughs> um, for how the Civil Rights Amendment has impacted my life and those around me, there are so many schools, either from before Reconstruction, throughout the Civil Rights era, and certainly in the years following Brown v. Board, that Black and Brown communities across Maryland still retain so much pride in. I see the license plates all the time. So at least within my own family, there are graduates of Garnett High School, Moton High School, Macy's Lane High School. And the rhythms that I gained from looking at those yearbooks or even listening to vinyls from the very same time as students were transitioning just to integrate some of our counties in Maryland, and in fact, the last county in Maryland, in Kent, I can touch on to, but also carry with me in my life now. So the impact that that amendment has had on my family shows up in my life, how I move throughout the world, and the confidence that I have, because despite many of those barriers, internally, we had built up so much resilience as a community. These were some of the very same spaces, despite being deprived from, where we were able to muster courage, confidence in ourselves, self-esteem, and ultimately build some of those legacies that continue to be passed on throughout our state and throughout the country. So that, that is a small nugget that I carry with me anywhere that I go. And relative to the second question, just as of last month, there have been nine states in the country that have passed laws that are similar. And this is pertaining to any institutions that are in those respective states, uh, very similar to our own legislature having just closed for session last week. It has been a monumental year for us legislatures across the country. And to Roderick's point, in, in an effort to backslide on so much traction that we had made federally, but also at the state and municipal levels too. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for, wow, that was a sprint to the front. Um, but Roderick, you mentioned all the cases, but it's interesting one case that he did not mention, which was Loving versus Virginia. So, you know, it's kind of, well, you know, the background of Loving v. Virginia, it's interesting that that case was not touched on in his opinion. So with that, we will move on to case, uh, case. Ooh, my JD is showing, I'll put that back in my pocket there. Um, I will move on to question number three, which is, in what ways do you think society has progressed since the enactment of the Civil Rights Amendment? And which, in what areas do you believe that there's still room, which kind of builds off our last question, still room for improvement? And Phoebe, since you were our shining light on the last one, since you were bringing, bringing in the joy, we'll start with you. Well, okay, so one thing I do want to point out is that, as we're, we mentioned, this is the sex, the 60 year um, anniversary. And so for someone of my generation, we often think of 60 years as a really long time. And when in the grand scheme of things, like you said at the beginning, time is relative and 60 years is really a blink in an eye if you really think about it. And so, of course, when you think about like all the progress um, we've made um, in this country, that often the first thing, of course, is the desegregation of many public spaces, at least in terms of the um, in terms of legal sense, whether or not. And again, this is one of the things we can improve on. Uh, society has very long memories. And so oftentimes there will be social constructs that still end up segregating certain areas. Um, you can kind of see this with the idea of like gentrification. Um, you can see um, with certain schools still kind of falling into those same lines when it comes to like the student population and especially like in the urban spaces. And so that is something that we can work on. And again, the ability really, I think the greatest, um, one of the greatest achievements of the civil rights movement is the ability for people of diverse backgrounds to actually come together and actually have the opportunity to interact with one another. And it also gives many voices that have been marginalized and disenfranchised um, for much of the history of this country to have, again, that opportunity to really 
join in, especially with so many industries and with work and career options. That's where real growth and innovation happens when you have diverse voices coming in and you have them truly mixing and bringing in their own backgrounds and their own experiences and letting people know from different backgrounds that there are other ways of doing this or that this may be a problem that you haven't realized is a problem because it has just not been in your environment. And so that's where I really feel like um, that's where society has progressed. And again, I'm a person who believes like in continuous constant improvement, that anything can always get better. And that, and this is again, a um, fallacy when it comes to the civil rights uh, movement is that it was just a one and done thing that there is nowhere else to go from here. And there is always a place to go from here. You ju it's just about putting in the work for it. And so that's where, again, there needs to be improvement in seeing that the civil rights amendment was not the end. It was simply another step, another step in the progression of society. See, we should just give you your degree already because that's <laughs> that that was definitely, you know, that's a St. Mary's you know, college answer right there. So definitely proud of that that last portion of it is that continual you know, movement forward because nothing stays static. So, Jaleon, your turn. I agree with Phoebe 100%. And perhaps I may bring us down a bit in sharing some areas of growth and improvement. It's been a turbulent past few years for our world. And particularly across the United States, we've seen a staggering rise in hate crimes. These hate crimes are intentional. They're directed at the very same groups we are speaking about having been justified through some tenets of this amendment. And uh, often our survivors from that very same period um, either being vilified or having their lives be threatened now in real time. And it draws me to think of Stephen Engel's publication fragmented citizens. There's still many Americans that do not have full legal protection in the workplace, in housing. We know redlining's history begins in Maryland, at least this form, and so many other spaces where you would seek a quality life and equitable access to resources. Folks are still clawing for that. So I do offer this as a resource for you to think through American governance, and who may still need allyship, sponsorship, support, and advocacy. These are constantly evolving fronts to Phoebe's point for us to overcome, but at the same time, be vigilant up against as well. So you, you could have been a St. Mary's grad with that answer. So, uh, you know, I guess you're honorary. So we'll, we'll give you that. And Roderick? Yeah, no, uh, Phoebe was spot on in her analysis there. Um, there's no doubts that we've had significant improvements, right? I think where we have to uh, address or turn the conversation towards uh, next is uh, equity. Um, we, for example, desegregated our schools, right? Well, there's still a significant achievement gap um, that, we're, that we're aware of. And so just on the education front, um, there's still improvement uh, to be made. Thank you very much, Roderick. For those in the audience that don't know, let me put a pull back the curtain a little bit. The reason why I keep chiding, you know, Jay Leon about St. Mary's is he's outnumbered on this panel um, because there's two, in addition to Phoebe's connection to St. Mary's College, I just don't work there at St. Mary's College. I'm also an alum of St. Mary's College of Maryland and Roderick is also a St. Mary's College um, of Maryland along the uh, National Public Honors College. So it's one of those things where, you know, it's friendly, you know, banter amongst us all. So I have to put that plug out there so people understand why that that terminology is coming out. So it's not as, a, as a former member of the admissions office, I, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All righty, all righty. Um, let's 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 think about 
you know, when we move about improvement, you know, you know, because this panel is about young people. Okay. And, you know, it's scary because you're saying age is relative, you know, like 60, you know, that's how I started because, you know, I didn't think, you know, at one point in time, I thought 60 was a long time. As I get closer to that number, it's not that long. So, but it is one of these things where I, I'm also in connection with young people. And I know the the power of young people. And I understand that it's either shared power or get out of the way. You know, unlike some of my people that I know or who may not be in direct contact with younger individuals on a continual basis. And this question, what role do you believe young people play in, in continuing the legacy of the civil rights movement and advocating for equity and justice? Also, can young adults work effectively with the generations that precede them? Are their viewpoints or are their viewpoints too desperate? And you're on the clock there, Jaleon. I think this question we could probably attribute our full hour to. And I do want to be very honest in sharing while my co-panelists and I certainly have things of merit to share. This is far wider than our own generation and certainly a conversation that everyone stands to gain from having on their street, in their community, across their state. Uh, ears and eyes are open at this point in time. And that's something that my own generation really benefits from. So a warm embrace is enough for us to get in the door and simply be proximate to something very special in continuing this effort or be directly involved. And that has certainly been the case in my life. I've just been brought along places. And it's not until later that I've reflected on the significance of what I was witnessing, who I was around, and oftentimes the extraordinary actions that come from folk that you would otherwise just consider ordinary. And I think that's a really important distinction to make, irrespective of what generation we're speaking about the lion's share of effort across the civil rights movement were taken up, executed, planned by folks with full-time jobs, families, um, really just trying to get by. And still they thought deeply in their heart and in their mind that this was a moral imperative to lend whatever they could towards. And that makes what we're aspiring to on this call, what I hope we'll walk away with and think about afterwards, very reachable and despite being context specific, very applicable to what we're living through right now. Thank you so much. Roderick, your turn. Um, to answer your question, you know, short answer is yes, young people, they have a crucial role to play in this, in this, in this in this movement. Uh, young people are passionate. I think what gets us in trouble sometimes is that we're impatient uh, uh, to, to fix things that we believe need to be fixed. Um, they're no brainers to us. Um, and, you know, we don't want to entertain the politics or the process. We just want it to be fixed. And we want it to be fixed yesterday. Um, I think uh, we as young people, we have to learn how to be uh, how to practice diplomacy with working with the older generation and taking the time to get to know them and learn why they move the way they move because uh, there's a reason to it and um, that that reason is probably a good lesson in to help you advance some of the things that you're working on as a young person um, I don't think there's a lot of daylight in between the older generation and the younger generation I just think there's a disagreement or a misunderstanding and approach and strategy, which can be overcome through dialogue. Um, so we just have to engage in more dialogue with um, the different, you know, the older generation, the younger generation. It's it's a it's attainable, it's achievable. We just have to be about it. And Phoebe, I completely agree with a lot of Roderick's points that he made. 
the role of young people is especially noble, especially when we're talking about like movements and progressing society forward, because young people and young adults, we're still trying to figure out our identities, our place in the world, um, where we feel like where we belong. And oftentimes we're not really so set in our um, biases and um, our views of the world that we kind of question why does it have to be this way? And like Roderick mentions, that can kind of make us seem like really impatient that it doesn't have to be this way. But at the same time, and this is where I feel that young adults need to be able to work effectively effectively with the previous generation, kind of like what Roderick mentioned, that previous generations, that is where the benefit of age does come in, that they've been here long enough to understand why things are the way they are, or what compromises had to be led here. And that's where the diplomacy really comes in. And I, I don't believe that there's any, um, any viewpoints like too disparate that there can't be some sort of disagreement, that there can't be some sort of agreement. I just feel like it's the dialogue that matters in closing those gaps because when you see that there, we aren't really all that different in terms of our basic needs and wants, we all want to be treated with decency and respect. We all want to have a quality of life. That does not change whether you're young or you're old. And understanding that is simply all right, what is the work needed to get here that it's not just simply it gets done immediately, but that there's a step-by-step -step process. And again, it goes back to the idea that we are not at a beginning or we are not at an end. It's simply another step in the movement forward. And that's where I feel that previous generations and young adults are able to work together and where they need to unite at. And also just the idea that that we can indeed work with one another and that we each offer each other something we really need and wisdom, whether there's wisdom in being young and there's wisdom in being older, and we have to take into account that we need both sides. That, but all of you have said very much the most eloquent things in the world, which is we need to listen with each other. And, and in some ways that you you have alluded to, which is compromise is not a bad thing as long as there's progression. And I think in our society today, a lot of that has been lost, is that we've gone to a zero-sum game, you know, that it's an all or nothing. And that's one thing that all sides need to hear is that sometimes we have to work together and give a little to get a lot and uh, to move us all forward um, to ensure that we continue to move forward to be as inclusive as possible. How can we ensure, moving on to our next question, how can we ensure that the principles of the Civil Rights Amendment based on equality of voice and opportunity are upheld and protected for future generations? Because that, you know, that's what it really comes down to. How do we continue sort of with this great experiment of a country, but also, you know, the different things that we've done to ensure that everyone has a voice. And uh, Roderick, this one goes to you first. Well, I think we have to uh, discuss uh, what's been um, rolled back uh, that was once, you know, considered, you know, settled, settled material. I think about um, Shelby V. Holder and what was rolled back in the Civil Rights Act, uh, mainly, you know, section, section... Could you tell people what Shelby B. V. Holder is? Not everyone's as abreast as you are, <laughs> and maybe members of this panel are. We've got to remember that when we talk, we got to make sure everyone understands, okay? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, it was a Supreme Court case that... Um, gutted uh, the Civil Rights Act 1965. It uh, did a couple things. Uh, it addressed Section 5 and Section uh, 2. Uh, Section 5 is the one that um, sticks with my mind the most. Uh, it was the pre-clearance section. It, it basically had, was a formula uh, that determined that based on a state's history of enacting laws that created barriers to the ballot box, uh, 
they had to, um, anytime they wanted to propose another change to their voting law or procedure, they had to present that change to the Department of Justice for pre-approval. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, felt that that uh, formula that was uh, being used um, was outdated, um, not fair, and they put the question back to Congress uh, to come up with a new formula. Um, that legislation is called the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, by the way. Uh, there is a, a, a legislation, it has been introduced in Congress to uh, fix this, um, but I think um, uh, to get, you know, back to the question, you know, because of that decision that came about in Shelby v. Holder, we've seen states move to enact policies that have created barriers to the ballot box, have made it difficult for people to exercise uh, their vote to, uh, their right to vote. Um, we've seen states increase uh, voting purges uh, in, uh, in their state. Um, this is not um, theory. This is what's happening since this uh, Supreme Court case. And I think we have to um, you know, kind of walk in, we have to walk and chew uh, gum at the same time as a younger generation. We have to work to restore once what was already settled, and we have to work to, you know, Phoebe's point, continue to uh, progress as a society. So um, that is something that I think about anytime that we're talking about um, uh, the future generations. I, I immediately think about what was already achieved that has been rolled back. Um, and then I think about what we have to do to continue to push the needle forward for future generations. There's a lot of work. And Phoebe, we'll go to you on this. All right. So Roderick did a really good job. I agree with a lot of his points. I also kind of want to add, you had mentioned um, that the idea that we are a, that this country is an experiment and that it's, an, it's a living, breathing experiment. And oftentimes when we treat issues, especially about like civil rights movements and um, and basically the rights afforded to us in this country, we always feel like they're set in stone, that they happened in the past, they're set in stone. There is nothing that can be added or taken away. And the reason why we have amendments in our constitution is because our constitution itself is a living, breathing document, that it's supposed to be able to be fluid with the times that people are living in. So oftentimes when you have enough time moving forward, and you see this a lot throughout the history of this country, is that when a lot of when enough time has moved forward and is no longer the focus of the majority in this country, that there can be a, re a rollback and a repealing of rights because it's supposed to be a settled issue. And so when I'm thinking about like, how do we um, uphold these rights for our future generations? One, the vigilance that we do already have going on that we are not ignorant to the issues going on with the rollbacks of like say DEI or the, or the civil rights movement, we're not ignorant to it and that we are vigilant and that we are seeing it. And that's one of the biggest um, steps but knowing that this is not an issue that can be quieted or swept on, under the rug, but also letting future generations know that they are still empowered by these movements and these rights, and that informing them of their rights and guarantees as citizens of this country, that that is the way we get future generations invested into the continuation of their own rights. And that's how we get young people moving into positions of power, say, in government, say, in industry, and making those changes because we have effectively taught them their rights and we've actually taught them the history of their rights and taught them that these rights are not necessarily a guarantee, but they are a promise that you will continue and actively maintain them. Wow, thank you. Follow that one up, Jayla. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't agree more with each of you. And my mind is resting on remaining cautious of narrowing our focus to just the judicial branch alone and maybe ensuring confidence in the democratic effectiveness of advocacy by lifting up the names of those who dared to lead positive change. I know that folks may recall last February the civil rights attorney, Benjamin Crump, 
um, had St. Thomas University name its law school after him. It's the first time this actually happened for a practicing attorney, much less a black civil rights practicing attorney. But I'd like to remind us of Fannie Lou Hamer. So President Lyndon Johnson attempted to derail the broadcast of her testimony before the Credentials Committee by calling an impromptu press conference where he was announcing the nine month anniversary of Governor Connolly and, and JFK being shot. And earlier in the hearing, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke, but it's really her words that shook the power structure to its core. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read just a snippet from her transcript and the Southern Poverty Law Center did a really nice recap of that, which I just put in the chat. It was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register become, to become first class citizens. And that's how she leads. And I honestly feel like the reverberations of this call for mandatory racial parity in state delegations in 1964 can still be felt today, especially this year being an election year. But It'll mark 29 years since the Council of African American Leaders and the MOK Junior Committee and Anne Arundel first recognized women in Maryland who are making their own mark in Anne Arundel to improve civil and human rights. So I honestly want to make sure that we also acknowledge that there are ways to inclusively tribute people who have led this work as voting rights activists, civil rights leaders, philanthropists. And I would be remiss if I didn't announce and share for those who might not have seen, the Banneker Douglas Museum was renamed this week to the Banneker Douglas Tubman Museum. So I don't want to limit freedom fighting just to this period, just this year that the bill passed, but for centuries of people that we can look to who have showed us the way and, and led the charge and faithfully pass the baton to each of us on this call and so many more. And you know how to move things into the next question, which is what challenges still exist in achieving true equity for all, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, or identities? And Phoebe, we're starting with you. All right, so when I looked at this question, I immediately thought about some of my education courses. And one of our most more common sayings and teachings is the difference between equality, equity, and basic universal design. And so you have an example of three um, boys and they're all trying to watch a baseball game. And, and, it, and there's a huge fence in the way. And one ball, one boy is really tall, one boy is medium height, and the other boy is very short. And so equality would be everyone gets one crate to stand on. And so only the tall boy, who is already naturally tall, really can see over, and the others are still struggling to see over. And then the difference between equality and equity is the idea that instead, everyone gets a crate that they need of appropriate height so that they can all see over in the same place. But what makes universal basic design especially interesting and what I think of as true equality is that it gets rid of the barrier itself, which is the, the wooden fence and replaces with, with a chain link fence. So no matter your height, you could still access the game. You could still see it. And so when I think about the challenges that still exist for achieving true equality for all, regardless of race, gender, or sexual orientation, or other identities is the idea that we try to do a lot of um, band-aiding over the issue. We try to just put band-aids over it. And it's harder, but it's more effective when you get to the roots of the barriers and systemic inequalities and really seek to actually remove it. And so I feel like that's where the real challenge is when it comes to achieving true quality of the systemic barriers that we still have in place that we're still failing to address either because we don't really know how to address or because it's just so much harder to address it than simply putting a Band-Aid over the issue. 
or ignoring it in general. Jillian, we're going to go back to you on this one. And thank you, Phoebe, for that wonderful answer. Yes, thank you, Phoebe. I will be brief here before Roderick is following, and that is to share. We need to be very cautious about who we're speaking on behalf and for. I think there are so many well-intentioned people, eager people to join on the side of those seeking equality and equity in many cases. But it is dangerous territory to be paraphrasing and even to the extent of appropriating. So despite this past Congress being the most diverse ever, we still stand to benefit from hearing so many more voices. And I don't want us to leave this call thinking that's solely precluded to those who are elected. Um, there are people in your friend group, in the place that you may work, probably on the road alongside you every single day who are waiting for someone to make space in particular on, on even on calls like these for us to simply sit back and listen. So I definitely think that's one of many barriers to be discussed for this question, but I do not think we have heard from all of the voices that we need to, nor have we attributed the appropriate value to each of them that they are due. Thank you. Roderick. Yeah. Um, I yeah, everything that Jalen just said, um, I think the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges uh, in achieving true equality is that not everyone believes it. And uh, it's on all of us to actively and consistently combat any uh, notion that goes against achieving true equality. I think uh, uh, when more of us are operating from the same starting point, and that is the belief that we all deserve true equality, I think it's easier for us to navigate our politics collectively. Um, I think we, a lot of times we are saying we want to achieve this for this outcome, but we're not really explaining why we want to move in that direction and why it's necessary to move in that direction. Um, and it's a lot of uh, convincing uh, people uh, of why this is the right way to go. Um, so I, th I think there's still a healthier part of society that is not 100% um, bought in into the notion of, of true equality in the sense that my uh, colleague here, uh, Phoebe, uh, spoke about, which is equity. Um, um, I'm, I'm not sure if people are truly on board for that. And so there may be, uh, there's more educating that we have to do on that front. Very good. I want to make sure I get this question in just looking at the time, because I could talk to you you all all night into into weeks, but I want to make sure I give the audience a chance to to have a discussion. You know, we didn't just bring you on here to talk about you know, the questions I have. I want to make sure people understand what you all have been up to. All right. So what are you doing right now that you would like to share that addresses the tenets of the civil rights movement? So I'm going to start with Roderick first. And since, you know, you were last, the last shall be first. So we'll, we'll go back to you. All right. Um. Uh, so, so um, for those of you who don't know, I am a member of the, the St. Mary's County NAACP. I have been since I, my, my stumpy days in St. Mary's College. Um, and, and much of my work in, in, in volunteering in that organization has been centered around drawing attention to the at-large voting system that is currently in practice in St. Mary's County and in other jurisdictions in, in our state. Uh, what people may not be aware of is that one of the things that the Civil Rights Act uh, uh, of 65 did is that it banned at-large voting in our federal elections uh, due to the discriminatory nature of, of that system. Uh, it has a nasty uh, past history of where it, where it came from, and um, the fact that it's still in practice in, in parts of our state uh, 
is a, is a, is an issue for me personally, and much of my work uh, has been educating people on the on that on that system of voting, its history, why it's problematic, and there's uh, legislation that's been introduced in the Maryland General Assembly uh, for at least the past three sessions, if not uh, longer than that, called the. Um, Voting Rights Act for counties and municipalities, and it would is essentially codify the Voting Rights Act of 1965 into Maryland law, and it's 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 something that I'm really passionate about because we often speak about states being laboratories of democracy. Well, if that is the case, then we have you know opportunity to kind of lead the way here in Maryland of you know kind of going back to what Phoebe mentioned early on and continuing to to show that progression. And if 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 our our prior generations achieved the federal uh, civil rights act, then it only makes sense that we bring those protections here on the local and state level as well, because we do see uh, injustices that uh, are still taking place that should not be taking place. Um, so that's some of the work that I I've been engaged in um, um, in, 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 in in my space. Okay. Phoebe, we're going to go to you since you're a short timer. All right. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't admit that since I'm a St. Mary's College of Maryland senior, not to mention the St. Mary's way, which is that as a member of St. Mary's College of Maryland, we all agree that we are working with others to develop this community as a place of toler tolerance, as a place that acknowledges the uh, Basically, that the land that we are studying on, the land that we are working on, and the land that we are innovating on is one that has had historical harm done to many marginalized groups, but also taking our very diverse voices together to make this place a more inclusive place of learning. And so I would be remiss not to mention that. Also, I am going into education as a teacher. And one of the things that I want to do that as an English teacher is teach my students the ability of context, especially when we're looking at a lot of things that basically understanding where we get a lot of this history from, what were the historical senses of discrimination or privileges that we are all afforded in different ways and how that impacts us today as learners right now. And so basically teaching my students about their rights as citizens and teaching them that they can be learners and they can be informed learners and that they do have the opportunities and the abilities to go forward and to push forward and really to keep the movement going in their own ways with their own talents. And this is a, and teaching in my family is a very rich thing. My grandmother was a teacher. My great grandmother was a teacher. Uh, I just remembered, I believe my mother once told me that she was one of the first 60 teachers of color in Orange County, Florida. And so really understanding that that is the legacy that I am pushing forward as another one of my family that it's being called upon to teach that that is what I really feel embodies the Civil Rights Amendment. I would also be remiss not to mention that I have finished my SMP, which was a graphic novel adaptation of a slave narrative, because understanding how far we have gotten since just a few centuries ago to the Civil Rights Movement to now, and understanding the differences and the progress we've made and the progress that's still needed and still that we should often push forward, I believe, really address the tenets of the Civil Rights Movement Amendment. Okay. All right. Well, Jalan, go. <laughs> you guys just blow me away every time you talk, so go right ahead. In bridging that wonderful legacy that Phoebe is inheriting from Florida and to put a smack dab with where Roderick left us off with voting, I have stepped into the mission of one of the most important educators, civil rights, and women rights leaders of the 20th century, and that's Mary Jane McLeod Bethune. Many of you all may be familiar with the coastal powerhouse that is Bethune-Cookman University, but very seldom do people know a few decades before that institution of higher learning came to be, 
She founded the Daytona Beach Literary and Industrial School for training Negro girls. And I've founded the Needles Eye Academy alongside my wife and sister as an unapologetic means of black and brown empowerment for young students of color on the Eastern shore. It's the Delmarva Peninsula's first think and do tank. And we're engaging diverse high school students in dismantling many inequities that exist in American education. And most of those stemming from the false premise of inferiority and many unprecedented anti-literacy laws from 1740 to 1867 that were stoked by fear and prohibited enslaved and in some cases free people of African descent from learning to read or write. So, so much of what we know that's paradoxical or um, very unique to the systemic inequities that we face in this country emanate from either autobiographies or personal writings of predecessors of my own on the Eastern Shore. And in partnership with public school districts on this side of the Bay, public libraries and community-led organizations, we are moving in the way of redefining what a canon is and empowering voices, harnessing passions that are often left out as being shuttered. So as two examples, over the past few months, we've been one of 128 educational leaders across the country to be named 4.0 Tiny Fellows. And through this, we're advancing a pilot for the Eastern Shore to Anchor, the very first rural chapter of the 826 Network, which is the largest youth writing network in the country. And the second of which is we're leaning towards Unbound Futures by sponsoring two full ride scholarships to the Cherry Tree Young Writers Conference at Washington College, which is home to the largest literary arts prize in America, more than the Pulitzer and the National Book Award combined. So if you know of any high school students that are rising sophomores up through seniors that are inching towards a space where they might be able to find their voice and critically reflect on how best to use it, that is work that I'm involved in on a daily basis and very proud to be. Yeah, and you find some time to sleep, so, and, and travel and all those different things. So, <laughs> all right, we're going to jump over to some of the questions from our from our wonderful audience in our last few minutes. Um, one is, how has the Civil Rights Act impe- impacted the wealth gap? And along those lines, what actions do you think might help lessen that gap? The achievement gap in education. Why do you think there is an anti-woke movement on the far left as well as the far right? So I'm just throwing that out there. Who wants to go first? All right. Um, I'm willing to go first. Okay. Um, so if I'm, I want to kind of address the second question because that really caught my attention. I was wondering whether or not I was going to hear anything about like anti-woke um, during this, because I feel like that is very much tied to this conversation. And so I, I know that woke and woke culture has been pretty much, it's a media term that really took an internet um, term and internet culture and really expounded it to meaning anything that deals with any form of like diversity that deals with any form of discrimination that deals with anything of shaking up the status quo of of our social structures. So I do know where that comes from. Um, I do feel like when it comes to like the far left or the far right, there is again, the sense of radicalism that is about in terms of how far do we wanna really take this and what is actually realistic so there's this sense that when you're talking about like anti-woke, it's the idea that, oh, the people in privilege are wrong for having their privilege. And so that means the, you're wrong and you're a horrible person for even having any kind of privilege. And that is what is the con- the conception of what it means to be considered woke. And that's why you feel like a lot of people who identify as either cis, who, who are white or who... um or male, they um, tend to feel like that they're the ones being most attacked by the ant- by wokeness. And I do know with the far left and with um, 
more progressive groups, it can almost feel like when you take when it seems like it's being taken too far, there's a sense that, well, we really can't live up to it right now. And so there's a sense of, well, why even try to even go that far? And so there's a sense of what compromises are we willing to make? And when it comes to the trigger word of wokeness, there's a sense of we don't want to make any compromises. It's wrong or it's right. And so um, another thing about what the previous question I mentioned about like the gaps that um, kind of like came about after the civil, the, um, civil rights amendments, um, especially like the gaps in education, again, and something that I've learned in my education classes and something that I've even seen in my own um, education experiences is that after there was an influx of a lot of students of color and going into a lot of schools that had been previously segregated, even though the practice um, that you couldn't be discriminated against for your race or your sex, there was a lot of times found that um, teachers of color were not being retained as long as, um, as the white teachers. And so there was a sense of disparity between the communities. So that even though we have now this law that kind of prevents discrimination, that's supposed to prevent discrimination, there's still a sense of the social memory that really wants to kind of keep things as status quo as that seems less upsetting, especially when you are in a majority position. And so it's not as concerning to you. And to addressing that, especially with education, one of the things that I always hear from my mother and I always take with me is that the idea that the next generation ought to do better than the previous generation, that you ought to have more opportunities, you ought to have more education, you ought to have more wealth than the previous generation. And that is because the work of the generation you're in and the previous generation has to compound together so that it can push forward the future, that we are all planting seeds in a garden that we never get to see, if you don't mind my reference. That the idea that in closing that gap, we have to do the work now and understand that we will not see most of the benefits until the previous generation, until the next generation, when they think that this is just as the world's supposed to be. That yes, I am supposed to be I am supposed to have these rights. I am supposed to have more than my parents, that this is just the way I've grown up and this is the way it should be. And under, and also teaching them that they also must do the same for their future generations. Wow. Kimmy, did, did they email you that question and allow yeah. you to, like, do you have a teleprompter there, like feeding you in for, that was fantastic. And I'm not going to ask the other two of you to try to, expand on that because i think she knocked it out of the park and hit all the key points um so phoebe you can rest on this next one because a plus stars i mean just wow it was like you were you were like okay who's gonna ask me this question i've been waiting all day for this (laughs) meredith and erna i did try to make sure i complimented what phoebe was sharing with some resources that you might be able to reference um, after the call. So please be sure to pull those before we get booted out. There we go. That was perfect. Th- see, this is, you know, this is the reason why we're such a good team that, you know, everyone works, works well with each other. Um, and the next question, which is, do you believe that multimedia, social media, you know, and, and other, other types of media that, that technology, um, that, that way of communicating today gives your generations, because actually you guys, kind of spread over across two generations, the back end of one and beginning of another, um, a better chance of changing the hearts and minds of all folks for the betterment of us all. I think, I think, yes. Um, I'm kind of cautiously saying yes, uh, (laughs) because I know that, you know, social media is a, is a you know a tricky tricky thing um and especially now in the age of i think of increased uh disinformation that it finds itself on social media you have to be um pretty good at uh analyzing the information that is put before you so i think uh, yes it's it's it increases our ability to communicate with our peers which is great right 
but it also increases the ability for misinformation to spread and get out there at, at, a, at, the, at a speed that we never thought was possible before, which is very dangerous. And so, uh, yes, cautiously, yes, uh, you know, with that extra context there. <laughs> Jerome, I really appreciated this question. And to, to Roderick's point, I'm going to emphasize speed. So similar to Phoebe, I've been waiting on a question like this all evening. And I think it's maybe a point that I can offer for us to consider as well. So th about this time last year, I had the privilege of visiting the Museum of Science in Boston. And I spent most of my time in the Making the Invisible Visible exhibit. My, my hope is that the redemptive spirit of the civil rights movement, as well as much of the agony that's very visceral, resonates with those who are at the leading edge of developing artificial intelligence. It's my reflection that brings me to the Algorithmic Justice League, and its founder had worked on a thesis at MIT in grad school, which uncovered really large racial and gender biases at tech giants like Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, things that each of us interact with on a daily basis. And despite navigating a new frontier of capabilities being exciting, it's also a mixed bag of concern, um, particularly for moral, ethical, legal harm that directly targets people of color. So, the, the process of building AI, as I have been learning, is a very human endeavor. And any of the changes that we make as it evolves will reflect the choices that we are making collectively. So it really is incumbent upon us, uh, upon our friends, uh, upon our colleagues to always center civil rights and equity as a lens so that public understanding of this growing technology is deployed for the benefit of everyone rather than the expense of a few, which is what we spent a lot of time speaking about this evening. Wow, thank you. It's it's one of those things where, you know, if you only deal with the folk that look like you, a lot of product you're only gonna make is gonna value and be for the folk that are of you. So that's the important thing to always remember why spaces need to be as diverse as possible because it needs to take in the multitude of personalities that are, are around us. And we just got another question that popped up. Uh, oh, I was just thanking for all the links. So there I go. Before we close, I want to give you the opportunity for any closing words. So... You know... <laughs> there was a question. There was a question that uh, you provided to us that that you could have answered, but due to uh, shortness of time, we didn't we didn't get a chance to get to it. But I want to use this opportunity to shine some light on that question. Uh, All right. The, que the, the question was for everyone uh, in the audience: was how could we encourage meaningful dialogue and action around civil rights and social justice issues within our communities and society? And I think that's a very important question. I think we have to encourage civic participation early on in one's life. And so it's not taboo to them when they become of age, like voting age to become, you know, active civically, you know, you can become active civically as early as, as humanly possible, right? Um, I think civic organizations play a crucial role in our society and we should introduce people and promote civic organizations as much as we as we can. I think it's within those organizations where the meaningful dialogue can take place in a, in a, in a more meaningful way, uh, can I say? Um, and so I just really wanna emphasize that, uh, you know, on a personal note, civic organizations have been huge to me and, and my development, growth and understanding of the society that we live in. And I just think that we all would benefit by being more engaged Specifically, so I just wanted to Perfect. Perfect. shine that and light that, on that important and, question. And, and since, since you're already open, go ahead. And any other closing remarks that you want to make? I just I just want to thank um, uh, this organization and, and and my fellow panelists for joining me today. This is a, a great conversation. I think <laughs> another question that uh, was uh, was posed that we didn't get to was um, you know what could what 
I want to get this right. Um, uh, uh, what what can we do to encourage uh, the young generation in, in in the work that we do? And I think by having this panel, having this conversation, inviting us to be a part of it, to share ideas, and to share the work that we're working on is exactly what should be taking place. And I think we should uh, continue this. And I think you guys, Historic Slaughtery is setting a great example of how to invite young people to the table and to have uh, this this conversation. And so um, I just want to say thank you. And thank you for, for being here tonight. Phoebe, we'll go to you because I'm, I'm, I'm doing an L on my screen. All right. So Closing remarks. First of all, I want to just thank all my fellow panelists. I want to thank all the um, propners and coordinators who got this together. And I definitely want to thank everyone who came and actually into this little Zoom room and um, participated in this discussion that is vitally important. And so one thing that I want just everyone to take away from this is just the idea that I know you had mentioned in a question that we didn't get to is that what do we hope for 60 years from now? Um, what do we hope for in terms of civil rights and civil in the civil movement? I just hope that when we are looking back 60 years in the future and that we're looking back to, to today, that all we could all that we can say is that we did try, that we did not give into any despair, we did not give into the darkness, we did not see that this is all it can be. We saw that what it could be and we actively moved forward, that we continued on the legacy and that we did with our talents what we were called to do. And so that is what I want everyone to take from this. Bring us on, Josh. This may be a bit of a, a sobering reflection, but on this day, in 1956, Nat King Cole, very famous singer, was attacked while performing in Birmingham. And every year, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History announces a theme. Its founder started the very early beginnings of what became Black History Month. And this year's theme is African Americans in the Arts. Last month, the New York Times had published this feature titled The Dinner Party That Started the Harlem Renaissance. And it was published in retrospect, 100 years to the date of the actual dinner party. And in essence, it was speaking about how creatives and change makers need rest. My closing remarks here are really a plea. So before taking any action, we need to embrace and acknowledge where we are individually as well as make space for others to join us in that vulnerability. The power of gathering in a constructive manner without rigid or performative goals is, is limitless. And the humanities are full of mediums that have either fueled and at times sparked the movements that we have been discussing today. I really believe that harnessing energies that come from the arts will do a great deal in furthering authentic engagement needed to lead with empathy and encourage us to listen to hear. If you are looking for examples of this, Regina King's directorial debut, One Night in Miami, explores the night in 1964 when Cassius Clay became heavyweight world champion and met with Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, and Jim Brown in a Black-owned hotel in South Beach. And it just exemplifies how regenerative the arts can be even beyond their prescribed moment. So I really appreciate each of you for sharing this space with us, your comments, your thoughtful reflections. We've enjoyed reading them and answering them. Please continue in this work beyond this call and um, be mindful about inviting others to join you in that work too. Wow. You guys know how to give me some chills and um, give me a lot to think about um, continuously. And, you know, before I jump in, uh, we've said it continuously, but, you know, I, whenever I think of work like this, I think of it like as our self-improvement plan as a nation. 
you know, if we think of ourselves as starting out in January as the first of the year, and we come out and we come in gangbusters saying we're going to change ourselves and we're going to have our new diet and we're going to start working out and we're going to hit this goal weight. You know, we hit our goal weight. We can do one of two things. We can go back the way we were doing things or we can stay on the path of the new way we were going and be healthier to maintain that weight and continue to be stronger. And I think sometimes when we have acts like this and other things that we do in history, this is where being a student of history and why history and other things, the arts are so important because they go hand in hand. That we sit here and we have to remember that the work doesn't just stop once we reach a certain point. It's a continuation, as Phoebe, you eloquently said in the beginning, but we've kind of kept that tune going. And once you get to a certain point, you have to ha cast that bent baton off to that next person to run that portion of the race if your legs get tired. And for some of us older individuals, that means we have to step aside to allow some younger legs. And by what we've heard tonight, we shouldn't be afraid to step aside. So for us to remember, on July 2nd of 1964, President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act after 75 days of a filibuster. And actually an attempt at sabotage by adding women to the bill, which actually passed, which gave us Title IX. So remember that. We must remember that this was not the first time that we tried to do work like this in this country. But this is the first time that an act like this would work for the citizenry. Also, we have to understand the irony of a president, the irony of a president who signed it, a Southerner, and in his heart, may not have been a friend to any of those that the act was, was going to uplift. But he understood the politics and the human impact of not signing the act. We must remember that to thrive as a country and society, sometimes we must put aside our thoughts and agendas for the best course of action, for what is best for our country and community. We must stand above and stand together for all those that are around us. And Nancy, I'm going to kick it over to you so you can close us out. Nancy, you're talking you wonderfully, me. but we can't hear you. You can't hear me. My com my computer's just doing weird things, and that's because I'm just blown away by listening to all of you right now. You know, when we talk about trying to do a better job, we talk about empathy and perspective. And I think, to me, the younger generation, this comes more naturally I, than it does. I think there are biases and racism is 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 a learned behavior, isn't it? And one of the things that we need to start listening to is, is are these uh, voices of people who don't look like us, who aren't our own age, who are different than us. And you have just in an incredible way tonight been able to bring voices that I think I, I'm going to be listening to you guys leading us. And I'm going to say I knew them when I knew them when I'm going to. Some, one of you, at least one of you is running for office. I know it's going to happen and I'm going to be voting for you and I'm going to be campaigning for you. Your voices are lending us ways to, to, to join together because this is, this is our history. This is our country. This is our world. And if we don't take those steps and, and do it in unison and embrace intergenerational support for each other to try to make this happen, we're not going to get there. You all are inheriting a world that we should have fixed this already. And you guys are inheriting and it's not fixed yet. 
but hopefully together we can make that difference. And I am, this is not the last time we're gonna have, have you guys with us. This conversation needs to continue. This is a start. We started last November. We're gonna have another, this is the next step. This conversation is gonna continue. And I hope that we can call on some of you to come back, be down where you're gonna be, but there's always videos. Have you guys come back and continue these conversations in ways that we can make this change. I'm so great, grateful to all of you. So let me just say to everybody tonight, I'm glad you came here to join. This is gonna be recorded. It's going to be on our website. I know there were a lot of people who signed up tonight who weren't able to come, but they are looking forward to seeing it later. We want this to be broadcast. These voices, the things that you've heard need to be heard by so many people and we're gonna make sure that that happens. There is another uh, event coming up in May. We hope a lot of you can join us for this as well. This is going to be a wonderful Descendant book that has just come out, one of, from our trustee emeritus. I, actually, two trustees came together to create this book, and it is the Barber Family, From Slavery Through Segregation and the Civil Rights Movement by Donald Barber and David Brown. This is gonna be an in-person but hybrid event. You can join, um, you can join from far away. So Jalen, you don't have to come over the bridge. If you, if you want to join us, but it will be in person and many, many of you may yeah. you will come and get the book for yourself. So these conversations, these reflections on the past, these reflections on where we need to go together are going to continue. I am so grateful to all of our panelists. You are amazing. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Good night. And God bless.